going to talk about the wider historical context before we get down to looking at some of the problems that we have uh, with representation. Obviously, throughout history, disabled people have been seen as uh, victims. Uh, we are people who deserve charity. Here we have a number of pictures, sort of just picked at random really. The top there, people from the workhouse, where a large proportion of disabled people were placed. Uh, the original hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, although Victor Hugo's book showed him in a, a humanitarian light, the filmmakers had to make him look very horrific. People being whisked off to uh, mental hospitals, witches, which we're coming up to soon at the end of this month, everybody dressing up as witches. But few people know that the witch hunts across Europe that lasted for more than 200 years, one of the prime targets was disabled women and women who had given birth to disabled children, and they were killed because they were the, had had intercourse with the devil. Or coming more forward, what happened to us, which is mentioned in the Sorry piece, yes, disabled people, more than a million of them were killed under the Third Reich because they were people who were unfit for life, the useless eaters. And we need to remember that. Or in the cinema screen, and you've got in your pack the uh, thing that Disability History Month did last year on moving image, which just shows you the plethora of representation. It's slightly improved, there are more disabled characters, but nevertheless, people like Two-Face in Batman Forever, one side good, one side bad. So we have this dichotomy that comes from Plato onwards, that one side of humanity is evil and bad and one side is good, and who personifies that more than disabled people who look different, who look bad compared to everybody else. And that has been an ongoing trend that has happened. And the better-minded people decide to give us some arms or charity, as in the top picture on the right, which shows uh, the good burgomasters of Holland giving uh, arms to those who had had leprosy. Leprosy arrived in Holland around 1600 and it spread very quickly till 10% of the population had it. And the answer of the Dutch government was to confiscate all their worldly goods because they had erred and were sinners. And we'll get their reward in the next slide as would the good burgomasters and mistresses who gave out charity. Meanwhile, the government of Holland did very well because it took everybody's wealth. So, there's a good scheme. Now, in history, throughout history, we have been there, because we are always part of the human condition. Disabled people develop impairments, people have born with impairments, people acquire impairments through accidents, war, and so on. And in fact, in war-torn areas such as Syria at the moment, we are creating large numbers of disabled people by bombing, and that means that the refugees who try to get to Europe, or increasingly not allowed, there are a much higher proportion of disabled people amongst those refugees. Um, so disabled people have either been completely rejected and outcast in some societies, they are an economic liability, grudgingly kept alive by their families, tolerated or tolerated by reduced uh, handouts from the state in, in modern Britain. Uh, or, as is the god Bez, who was of short stature in ancient Egypt, were respected uh, and participated to the fullest extent. People of short stature, blind people, played an integral part of ancient Egyptian culture, unlike in Greek and Roman culture, where they were seen as outcasts. And that view we look around the world, in most cultures, is predominantly a negative view. So, coming out of this history, we find that there are certain uh, stereotypes that reoccur. Now, stereotypes, as you know, are bunches of attitudes that are not based on reality, but are based on misconceptions. And yet, our drama, our literature, our films, our TV programmes are still full of these stereotypes. Now, the point about if someone's racist, you can usually tell. But the problem with disability is that at least 10 different stereotypes and it's harder for people to track their way through this. And so we often find the reproduction of these stereotypes as disabled people as sinister or evil, uh, often found uh, around the place. Um, so, for instance, Long John Silver, uh, I was called Long John as well as Crippled Dick at school because that was just part of the way that people who had a physical impairment at all, blind pew, who's horrific, witches, or indeed, I'll say more about Richard uh, III, which gives us a fantastic part, but also a fantastic stereotype. Uh, we are objects of pity. Think of the black opera, Porgy and Bess. It's all about pity for Porgy, uh, the poor crippled man. Or Tiny Tim in A Christmas Carol, 
Charity advertising relies on this a great deal. Uh, victims, whatever happened to Baby Jane, Wait Until Dark, and a whole series of other TV, rather second-rate shows relying on scaring a blind woman. Um, objects of uh, curiosity, freak show, uh, Igor in Frankenstein. Why is Igor there? Why is Igor always the hunchback? He's a secondary part in Frankenstein, but he's always, it's for atmosphere, to create this idea of scariness. Um, or we can be figures of fun. Jesters, freaks, Mr. Magoo, a whole range of uh, things. Think of the films. Uh, Hear no evil, see no evil, time bandits, uh, or the opera Rigoletto. Um, and so we go through. We're a burden, uh, and we also can be have a chip on our shoulder. Laura in Glass Menagerie, Heidi, Secret Garden, Doctor No, and all the other anti-heroes in James Bond. Uh, triumphing over tragedy, this is one we've just been uh, celebrating in a great extent on Channel 4 in particular, of these disabled uh, athletes. I've got no problem with people who want to do sports, but you know, it's the idea that those disabled people are the fantastic ones who triumph over tragedy. But what about all the rest of us who either don't want to or can't take part in these things? Are we to be put on the other side of history? Um, or, indeed, we're unlovable and can't love. Going back maybe to D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover, where Clifford Chatterley sort of says, no, no, I can't make love to you. Well, the, the Spinal Injuries Association produced a, a, a pamphlet saying, well, most people with spinal injuries can make love. So this is a, another stereotype. And we have this in Born on the Fourth of July, or O'Casey, Silver Tassie, keeps coming back. So that's a quick, quick thing, and a recent thing, more on television, but I think creeping in elsewhere. If the plot line is weak, why not spice it up a bit with a few disabled characters in stereotype roles? So I'm sure most of the artistic directors here don't engage in this stuff, but nevertheless, it is there, and there are many scripts around that have this in that people need to think about. How are we going to turn this around? How are we going to portray it in a positive way rather than a negative way? So we have the body beautiful, which as I talked about comes back from the ancient Greeks. Um, but, you know, we try, that's been turned around a few times. Think of the Fiorori when the statue of Alice and Lapper went up about 12 years ago at the Plinth in Trafalgar Square. Or the work of Mark Quinn, who really challenged our perceptions of what it is to be a beautiful person. That you can be beautiful without limbs. Disabled people as sinners. This of course comes from many of the monotheistic religions, uh, whether it be Judaism, uh, Christianity, or indeed Islam, unlike Eastern religions, which tend to see the evil and the good as a balance that the person themselves has to deal with, which is quite interesting. But there we have Lourdes, we had Lourdes mentioned, still many thousands of people every week going to Lourdes to seek the cure. I've got lots of disabled friends, quite a few went to Lourdes, none came back any different to <laughs> But this is reinforced, if you look at the architecture of pre-Reformation churches around the outside, you have this gargoyles, horrific ones kept at bay, and around the altar, pictures of perfect people. Now, most of those altar pictures, particularly in the Renaissance, were done 500 years ago. And at that time, in the population, there would have been a large number of people who had impairments. Smallpox was endemic, wars went on, and so this problem would have been uh, seen, but painted over. And I will mention Richard III, because I think it's quite interesting. Excellent performance by Ray Fiennes at the Almeida just uh, last month. Uh, but it's an interesting play, because the play itself is based on Tudor propaganda that Thomas More wrote to uh, ingratiate himself with uh, his monarch, which in the end didn't work because he had his head chopped off anyway. But he, he did bring in things that were not part of history. Yes, it looks, and we can now tell from the Leicester car park skeleton, that Richard did have scoliosis. But as a Channel 4 programme showed, that if it was strapped up, he could wear armour and he could fight and he could do all the other things that a knight needed to do. And as the skeleton shows, he did not have 
a withered hand, and he did not have a lame leg, which Shakespeare says. And so when he comes on, I am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into the breathing world, scarce half made up. The irony is Shakespeare, of course, creates a twist within this. Some directors bring this out more and some less. I thought that the Almeida production brought it out very well. Um, that he was also a very charismatic and attractive person, attractive to women and so on. With the, I'm not going through all the stereotypes, but Henry uh, VIII had a jester, William Sumner. There was also a, a female jester there. And a recent reconstruction, which is very interesting, um, which was done at Hampton Court, decided that they would bring actors with learning difficulties to uh, characterise what the jesters might have been like and what their lives might have been like at Hampton Court. Um, and call all the king's fools, and I would commend that as, as something that's quite interesting. And uh, something where no drama has been developed around all of that, but which could easily be developed. Or indeed this uh, rakes progress, which rich men and women crossed a Vauxhall Bridge to go to Bedlam, which originally was uh, where the Imperial War Museum is now, to laugh at uh, those less fortunate than themselves, um, pay the penny and, and so on. Or these early reels, two reelers or one reelers from the cinema. The laugh here in this one is that the car has gone over someone's leg. So you have a double amputee and the shot is before and after. That's all the joke is in the film. Uh, and I've mentioned Mr. Magoo and his, his uh, lack of sight. Or the Farley brothers who brought us ten films with negative stereotypes of disabled people which are quite atrocious like Dumb and Dumber and a whole series of others which make it very, very difficult for people with learning difficulty to get on with their lives in an ordinary way. The Burden. Here we have a, a painting uh, which shows the cripple, <coughs> as it's called, and the foxtail signify evil. Uh, or we have uh, a dumping ground for people in the 20th century, large numbers of people placed in institutions. Or we have DH, um, sorry, Dickens. Uh, here, one of his uh, characters. And uh, also, of course, those part of those one million people who were the burden in the Third Reich. So the burden is, is a very strong thing, and it's uh, something that's been evoked recently by ministers in both the coalition government and the current government to justify the massively disproportionate cuts that there are across disabled people, and more of that in a moment. Of course, disabled people in Europe, and particularly in the UK, were largely part of people's families. Uh, they worked as much as they could when the family lived on the land in feudal situations uh, where they couldn't walk anymore. There was a penny in the plate in the church of the parish poor law from 1600 onwards and people were given some support and help. With massive movements of people to the new industrial centres 200, 250 years ago uh, and the setting up of factory production, large numbers of people could no longer talk, take part in this process and so were increasingly abandoned and sent to the workhouse and elsewhere. In the latter part of the 19th century, we got uh, Darwin's cousin, Sir Francis Galton, putting forward the idea that we could selectively <coughs> breed human beings and breed out the uh, unfortunate characteristics. Now, that was based on false science, but it nevertheless took off and we had a huge increase in this uh, propaganda in the first part of the 20th century until in 1930 we had the Mental Deficiency Act that led to 130,000 people who had been living in the society, those who were on the marginal of uh, people, people who were not classed as idiots or imbeciles, but the feeble-minded. Uh, and here we have Churchill saying the unnatural, increasingly rapid growth of the feeble-minded classes, coupled with their steady restriction, install the thrifty, energetic, superior stocks is a race danger. And I feel that the source from which this stream of madness is fed should be cut off and sealed up before another year has passed. So that led to a vote in the House of Commons. There were only two MPs that voted against this legislation out of the entire Parliament. The propaganda had been so strong that these people represented a race danger. It led, with the interruption of the First World War, to the setting up the local authorities having responsibility to round up all the mentally deficient and 
on the say-so of two doctors uh, using spurious IQ tests, which I'm afraid current government seem to be wanting to bring back again to select children at 11, the same tests based on eugenics ideas, uh, the 11 plus, uh, were locked away for life. And it was believed generally in the psychological world that you could, that in intelligence was fixed and that it couldn't be changed. Uh, it wasn't until the 1950s, most intellectuals at the time believed this, D.H. Lawrence among them, there's a nice quote from him about exterminating uh, the halt and the lame. Um, but I could add to that H.G. Wells, Aldous Huxley, Bernard Shaw, Sidney Beatrice Webb, John Maynard Keynes, William Beveridge, in fact most of the social reformers of the 20th century had this idea. <coughs> so, we need to be careful when we look at material. When I was taught Brave New World at school, as one of the reading texts, I thought it was a political satire. But Huxley actually believed this stuff. He was a member of the British Eugenics Society. And that's what we need to look at our literature with a health warning on it. There are problems with a lot of the literature that we turn into plays. Um, disabled people are lives, are our lives valued today? Well, the, we have a number of plays, like Whose Life Is It Anyway, that address this issue. Recently, Liz Carr did a, her own musical play at the National Theatre, uh, no, sorry, at the Royal Festival Hall, Assisted Suicide, the musical, trying to bring out these issues, that it isn't just a personal issue, whether you want to have laws that mean you can go off to Switzerland and be killed, uh, or have it here in Britain. It's about the lack of support that disabled people get, particularly people who are newly acquiring impairments, so that it seems impossible, and that's why people are outside the uh, disabled people are outside me before you uh, premiere in Leicester Square, where Judge O'Moy's book about uh, a very rich young man who had everything except he had spinal injury, and he chose, even though he had the love of his carer who, who became his lover, he still decided he wasn't a proper man and he had to die, and we're left. Our second film, I believe, is coming out. She is, gets his inheritance, which he leaves to her, and then we see what she does with it. But that idea is becoming more and more common <laughs> uh, in society. And it's something that we as disabled people don't find acceptable, because it's based on the idea that our lives are not worth living. And yet many of us live our whole lives with our impairments, and as we heard from the sorry piece, we can manage perfectly well with the right sorts of adjustments. But there is this assumption, which is particularly in the popular press, that we can't. We have to be very careful about how those issues are tackled in portrayal. Now, from the disabled people's movement, we are no longer the flat earthers who say, well, it's inevitable, you've got a, a, an impairment, you can have a, a second-rate life, you're not going to manage. The problem was in the person, what we call the medical model of disability. One of the great changes in the world, which hasn't really permeated down beyond disability circles very far, is that we have a human rights convention, which is the same as all the other conventions that humanity has signed up to, which says, no, that way is out, it's finished. We are no longer the subjects of your interventions. We are objects in our own right. We make our own history. We're not uh, being labelled by you. That's for jars, it's not for people. We are protesting, we are fighting for our rights, and we want everyone to accept this social model that it's the barriers beyond the person that need addressing not our impairment. Yes, in time, some medical science may well come up as it has uh, with certain things that will help us, and I've certainly been helped by medical science, I wouldn't be alive today, and most of us wouldn't be without it. But it's not the focus. The focus is, once you have an impairment, once you acquire an impairment, it's people's reactions to you, people's portrayal of you, people's barriers that they present in the physical environment, the way that they institutions work, we had some fantastic illustrations of that in the piece before. So, you need all to join the paradigm shift. We are not objects, but subjects in our own liberation. Be our allies in supporting us to do that. We're not supported by government. These are the sorts of headlines that ministers have leaked uh, and continue to leak. 75% of us are fraudulent. And yet, uh, benefit claimants, which are fraudulent, are this tiniest piece of money that's lost here. So you have this 
polarity that we have in common parlance now. We have the superheroes in Rio or in London before, and then there's the rest of us who are just skivers. And in analysis of newspapers has shown that over the last four years, this sort of negative language has gone up very much. So we are in a new period of negativity towards disabled people. And you can be part of that or part of the solution. I would suggest we need to use the uh, now 167 Iceland signed up two weeks ago. Countries, which is a bulk of countries, have joined this convention which represents more than a billion people or 15% of the world's population. And that says that barriers of environment, attitude and organisation need to change. It also says in Article 8 that the portrayal of disability needs to be non-stereotype and not negative. So that's something that is there for everybody to engage with, but very few governments are so far engaging in it. And don't do it on your own. <coughs> we have a world of experience. If you want to have a part that requires disability, whether it be casting a disabled actor or not, although obviously we would prefer disabled actors where that's possible, but there's also the issue of what the storyline is. And don't put out a negative storyline where you don't need to. Get disabled people on board as advisors to the production. They will tell you what needs to happen and what shouldn't. And Channel 4, when it first set up, did this. We, they would not put out a program on disability without a disability advisor. And I was one of those back in the 90s. It's a pity they got rid of that because we wouldn't have had undateable which has caused huge furore for people particularly with learning difficulties who are made fun of all the time and is now franchised across the world. We had a, a young man last week in Geneva where we were reviewing 10 years of the convention who got up, uh, Mr. Martin from New Zealand, he's got learning difficulties and said, I am appalled that British TV has given us this stereotyped approach to disabled people. So there is something we can all do. All of us who deal with images, who deal with characterisation, we can actually become part of the solution, not part of the problem. And in the process, let's make sure we don't reproduce negative language, particularly that young people pick up. A survey was done by the Anti-Bullying Alliance the year before last. They found that 85% of young people, 18 to 25, thought it was alright to use the word retard, spaz, idiot or mom in their texts and so on, and it wasn't offensive. Those words are offensive because of the history they come from, the way they affect us. And you can drown in this language if you're not careful as a young disabled person growing up. So we need to be careful. And, you know, I had this discussion uh, with Richard Eyre when they put on the Cripple of Inishmar. This wasn't a classic piece, it was a commissioned piece. A commissioned piece of writing using the word cripple. What was it for? What was the point of it? Why commission things like that? Uh, so we need, the way forward is to explore our history and the struggle for equality, non-stereotype characteristics, scripts which include disabled people's lives, opportunities for disabled actors to play any part, cross-casting. We're getting used to that with black ethnic minority now. When are we going to get used to that on disability? When are we going to have Lady Macbeth played by someone in a wheelchair? When are we going to have Richard III played by someone who's not disabled, but maybe somebody else on the cast is? You know, we're doing that all the time. We saw a play, Travesties, where Lenin's wife was black. Great. Nobody's can't, nobody worried about that at all. Of course, she wasn't historically, but it doesn't actually matter. Why does it matter so much on disability still? Involvement of disabled writers, directors, technical support workers, and make performances accessible, which many theatres are doing, and thanks to the Arts Lottery Board, which is no longer much with us, but due to one man, Paddy Maysfield, who was a disabled director, it was he, on the Arts Lottery Board, that said, we must have back house as well as front of house accessible, and that has made many of our theatres now accessible in a way they wouldn't have been, because one man said, no, we're not doing that. Sometimes it is one person, but it needs everybody in the culture that surrounds theatre to be pushing in the same direction. A couple of last things. I think things are changing a bit. But Jamie here from the uh, Strip and the Opera. Great to see actual disabled actor in the national doing a part and adapted so he can do it, which I think maybe we can hear more about. Uh, it was good to see your production at the opening ceremony with Ian McKellen and a disabled actor playing a little scene from The Tempest. 
the government inspector we're going to hear more about the ramps to, uh, to the moon. Was it on the moon? To the moon. To the moon. Uh, and also Greyer production, also on tour in the, the national, the solid life of sugar water. And there are others <coughs> that are coming through. But it's still very much a minority that has to, a flame that has to be really protected and grow. Uh, and uh, I think we need to avoid some of the easy things like the day in the life of Joe Egg, or else completely rethink how we do that. The crippling Irish man, well, I've said what I think about that. The Phantom of the Opera. Bella, Ebet, Beauty and the Beast. There are in our literature stories that are recycled over and over again that are negative and stereotyped. And yet, the life of disabled people. There are so many disabled people who got on with their lives. And, uh, and yet, sorry, clicking too fast. I'm on one at last. Uh, <laughs> Hans Christian Anderson. Uh, a, w a woman who won the equipment of the X Factor in India, a one-legged dancer, she's now really famous throughout India. Uh, che Guevara, suffering with his asthma. Isaac Newton. Uh, Harriet Tubman. Julius Caesar. Benjamin Zephaniah. Judy Human, who advises uh, Barack Obama on foreign policy as a wheelchair user. Beethoven. And Emily um, Mullins, who's an actor, uh, a model, and a great... Uh, sports person. Stevie Wonder. Pablo Pineda, who starred in an uh, amazing Spanish film about a man with uh, Down syndrome. Not as a victim, if you like, but someone working in the Office of Social uh, Development who gets, keeps being confused for one of the patients. Or uh, then Jane Campbell, who's in our House of Lords, along with three or four other very important disabled people. Or Lord Byron. When are we actually going to see this rich vein of the lives of disabled people throughout history mind to actually give us a portrayal that is non-stereotype but looks at the diversity that there is in the lives of disabled people? Because we have been saying this just now. It was 1994 that we had the Invisible Children Conference. It was soon after that that we put out, uh, with the help of the BBC and the uh, PACT, this, which went to 30,000 people in the industry. This was 1995. Disability in the media. And we outlined the stereotypes, the history, and the way we could portray it. And yet, it's almost like that didn't happen in the mainstream media. We had the book Frame, which came out in, in 1992, which again, with Nabil on the front there, and uh, Anthony Sher, uh, with his spider portrayal of uh, Richard III, where, um, showing that there was an issue, or again, in 2004, when with the BFI, I wrote a book called Disabling Imagery, and we run a, a program and an online thing, and we educated thousands of children about this. When is that child who was at school in nursery in 1995, when is she actually going to see herself in everyday life, when she goes to the theatre, the cinema, television, and so on? That's the challenge. And we're talking about 90% of the UK population. So, if we're having diversity, Let's have a little more equality for disabled people. Thank you.